Let us have a quick recap of some of the topics that we have learnt in the previous lesson before moving on to the topics that we are going to learn in this lesson. If you remember, we have learnt the word Kathori in the previous lesson. And what does Kathori mean? Kathori can be translated as who, that, which and it is used to combine two sentences. So, it works as a conjunction. So, function of Kathori is as conjunction. And how do we use Kathori to join two sentences? Let us see. I have written here two sentences, simple sentences. Fkom nate sidhyat stujyanti. Fkom nate sidhyat stujyanti. The second sentence is stujyanti uchatsa vunivir sitcheche. The students are sitting in the room or in the hall and students are studying in the university. So, there are two sentences and if you use Kathori to join these two sentences, how the sentence would look like? Fkom nache sidhyat studyanti and then put a comma and then Kathori e uchatsa vunivir sitcheche. As you can see, Kathori refers to the noun or the subject in the second sentence. As we have already explained that Kathori decline or agree with the noun it refers to in gender, number and case. So, let us find out the number, gender and case of Stujanti in the second sentence. Stujanti is the subject here. So, this is in the nominative case. Stujanti as you can see it is a plural number and gender the plurals do not have any gender. So, Kathoriye is the form that refers to Stujanti. So, this is also in the nominative case plural number and case you already know nominative case. So, fkom nache sidhyat stujanti katori e uchatsa vunivasi cheche. So, that is how we use katori. So, to use katori you have to first find out the noun that katori is going to refer to and the number, gender and case of that particular noun and we will use the corresponding form of katori to use it as a conjunction. So, that is all about the revision part. We will move on to the topics that we are going to learn today. Start. We have already discussed about the compound future tense in Russian language. So, how do we denote future tense in Russian language? So, the one we have discussed was compound future tense. So, now in this lesson we will discuss about simple future tense. So, how do we denote simple future tense? So, this is our first topic in this lesson. If you remember that compound future tense is denoted by the infinitive form of the verb and the conjugated form of the verb bit, which is to be. So, it is an auxiliary verb. So, auxiliary verb plus infinitive form of the verb is used to denote the compound future tense in Russian language. For example, ya budu pisat etu knigu zavtra. So, I will read this book tomorrow. So, this is how we denote the compound future tense. Now, how do we denote the simple future tense in Russian language? So, we have to use the conjugated form of the perfective aspect. If you remember that we have discussed two aspects of verbs in Russian language. One is imperfective aspect and the other one is perfective aspect. So, when we use the conjugated forms of the perfective aspect, it will denote the future tense. Why? Because perfective aspects do not have any present tense. So, if I say zavtra ya prachitayu etu knigu, it will mean tomorrow I will read this book. So, now you will say that both these sentences mean the same thing. I will read this book tomorrow. But this can be better understood in Hindi. If we translate both these sentences in Hindi, the first one would be translated as Kal mein yah kitab padhunga. Kal mein yah kitab padhunga. And if you translate the other sentence, the, this one, Zaftaraya prachitayu etu knigu, it will be translated as Kal mein yah kitab padhunga. 
so here i am saying padhunga and here padlunga so in the second sentence we are telling the audience about the completion of an action padlunga it denotes the completion so that is why we are using the perfective aspect so these are the two ways to denote the future tense in russian language if you are using imperfective aspect the infinitive form of the imperfective aspect plus the auxiliary verb which in conjugation it will denote the compound future tense and if you are using the perfective aspect in conjugated form it will denote the simple future tense so now the question comes how do we conjugate the perfective aspect verbs so for this we have to look at the various conjugation rules we have already discussed how do we denote the compound future tense and simple future tense in russian language to use simple future tense in russian language you need to know how the verbs are conjugated so for this thing you have to memorize certain rules of conjugation so we'll start with the perfective and imperfective aspect pairs so as you can see chitaches imperfective aspect prachitaches perfective aspect pitch is imperfective we pitch is the perfective aspect pisach imperfective na pisach perfective aspect vidich imperfective u vidich perfective aspect itchi which is to go or to come is imperfective aspect and paichi is perfective aspect igrach to play is imperfective aspect and sigrach is perfective aspect as you can see the perfective aspects of these verbs have been formed by adding various prefixes for example here we have used the prefix pr here we na u p and s so these are the prefixes that we use to form the perfective aspect so let me tell you if the perfective aspect is formed by adding prefixes then the conjugation will be same as the imperfective aspect for example if you know the conjugation of chitach prachitach will have the same conjugation for example ya chitayu ya prachitayu on chitayet on prachitayet the same way ya piyu ya vi piyu ti piyosh ti vi piyosh onana piyot onana vi piyot and so on the same way pisach ya pishu ya na pishu ti pishesh ti na pishesh and so on vidich ya vishu ya u vishu on vidit on u vidit and so on itchi ya idu ya paidu ti jiosh ti paidiosh onana idiot onana paidiot ani idut ani paidut igrat ya igrayu ya sigrayu onana igrayet onana sigrayet mi igrayem mi sigrayem ani igrayut ani sigrayut so this is how we conjugate the perfective aspect of verbs which are formed by adding prefixes to the imperfective aspect now there are some alternation of consonants that happens when we conjugate some of the verbs so these alternations can be categorized broadly in some of the categories so here i have written some of them let's discuss them one by one the first alternation happens when we change the consonant s to sh as we have done in case of pisach so how do you conjugate pisach ya pishu so here we are not using the consonant s we have changed the consonant to sh ya pishu ti pishish onana pishit mi pishim vi pishite ani pishut so here the alternation happens between s and sh and this alternation carries forward to all the other forms 
the next alternation happens between z and z for example skazat skazat is the perfective aspect of gavarit gavarit is to speak so how do you conjugate skazat as i have already told you this z will change into z ya skazu tis kashish onana skashit mis kashim vis kashche anis kashut so here we are not using z in the conjugated forms we are using z the next alternation of consonants happens between the consonants k and ch for example plakat plakat is to cry or to weep so how do you conjugate plakat will not use k in the conjugated forms we will use ch ya plachu ti plachish onana plachet mi plachim vi plachiche ani plachet so this is how we conjugate plakat the next alternation happens between a group of consonant s k and it changes to a single consonant sh so here a group of cluster of consonant is there in the infinitive form which is changed to sh in the conjugated forms for example iskat iskat is to to find to look for so how do you conjugate iskat ya ishu ti ishish onana ishit mi ishim vi ishiche ani ishut so this is how we conjugate iskat so you let me repeat all these alternations once again the consonant s sometimes changes to sh as in pisat the consonant z changes to j as in skazat the consonant k changes to ch as in plakat the consonants s and k together changes to sh as in iskat so these are few alternations we'll look at some other examples also there are few other alternations also so we have learned the alternation of consonants in the conjugation of verbs when the alternation happens in all the forms all the conjugated forms of the verbs like pisat so when you conjugate pisat this consonant alternation from s to sh happens in all the forms ya pishu ti pishish onana pishit mi pishim vi pishite ani pishut now we will see we will discuss the alternations which happen only with the first person singular number with ya so th there are few verbs which follow e conjugation and the alternation happens only in the first person singular number ya the first alternation happens when the consonant d changes to j in the first person singular number for example if you conjugate this verb vijit the conjugation we have already discussed ya viju so this d changes to j ya viju but ti vijish so from ti onwards ti vijish onana vijit mi vijim vi vijite ani vidyat so with rest of the forms we are not following the same alternation so the alternation happens only with the first person singular number the next is t changes to ch for example stretches stretches is to meet and it is the perfective form of stretches so how do you conjugate stretches ya stretchu ti stretches onana stretches mi stretchim vi stretchiche ani stretches so here again we are following this alternation or this alternation happens only with the first person singular number ya yeah. and in rest of the forms we follow the same t the next is s changes to sh sprasit ya sprashu ti sprosesh sprosat sprosem sprosiche sprosyat 
So, here again with first person singular number ya, this alternation happens and with the rest of the forms it does not. The next is b changes to b and l. So, an, an additional l is added in the conjugation conjugated form with first person singular number. For example, lubit, lubit we have done it is to love or to like. So, how do we conjugate lubit? Ya lubliu. So, instead of using lubiu, we are adding an additional consonant la. Ya lubliu, ti lubish, onana lubit, mi lubim, vi lubite, ani lubit. So, again we are using this alternation in the first person singular number. Next is per changes to per and l in the first person singular number. For example, the verb kupit, kupit is the perfective aspect of pakupat, which means to buy or to purchase. How do you conjugate kupit? Ya kupliu, ti kupish, onana kupit, mi kupim, vi kupite, ani kupiat. So, again we are using this alternation in the first person singular number. Next is ver changes to ver and l, like gatovit, gatovit is to prepare, this is the imperfective aspect and what is the perfective aspect? Pre gatovit. So, how will we conjugate gatovit? Ya gatovliu, ti gatovish, onana gatovit, mi gatovim, vi gatoviche, ani gatoviat. So, here also we are using this alternation in the first person singular number with ya. The next is when the combination s and t changes to the consonant sh. So, here two consonants are changing into one. For example, the verb chistit, chistit is to clean. So, how do we conjugate chistit? Ya chishu ti chistish onana chistit mi chistim vi chistiti ani chistit. So, here again we are changing this combination of consonants into one. So, this s and th changes to sh. So, this is how we conjugate some of the verbs where con alternation of consonants happens. The next topic for this lesson today we have is the dative case of nouns. So, this is another case we have so far we have done nominative, accusative and prepositional cases. Now, we will discuss what is dative case of nouns in Russian language. The first thing we have to do is the interrogative pronouns or the questions to which the dative case of nouns answer. So, Kamu and Chimu. Kamu represents the animate nouns and Chimu inanimate nouns. So, if the question is Kamu, then the answer would be animate nouns in the dative case and if the question is Chimu, the answer would be inanimate nouns in the dative case. The dative case of nouns without prepositions denote indirect objects in a sentence. So, we have discussed what are direct objects. Now, we are saying that dative case denotes the indirect objects. So, how do you understand the term indirect objects? Let us look at some of the examples and it will be clear to you how do we define the indirect objects in a sentence. I have written here a couple of sentences. Ya pishu pismo drugu. Ya pishu pismo drugu. I am writing a letter to my friend. I am writing a letter to my friend and the next sentence is mi kupili padarak padruge, mi kupili padarak padruge. We bought a gift for our friend or for a friend. So, here as you can see I have written the interrogative word sto and here I have written kamu. So, if I say ya pishu pismo. So, here pismo answers the question shto and we have discussed that the nouns which answer the question shto 
are in the accusative case. So, here pismo and padarak both these nouns answer the question shto. So, these are direct objects and drugu and padruge they answer the question kamu to whom. So, these are the indirect objects. Why they are called indirect objects? Because the subject in both these sentences ya and mi are related to these nouns through the direct objects. So, if there is no direct object, there will be no indirect objects. So, that is why they are called indirect objects. They are indirectly related to the subject here. They are also defined as the recipient of the direct objects. For example, ya pishu pismo. So, this pismo druk is the recipient of pismo. The same way padruga is the recipient of padarak. So, that is how the indirect objects are also defined. Now, there are some verbs which have inherent direct objects in their meaning. So, that is why when we use them in a sentence, we will not write any direct object. For example, let us take savyetavat. Savyetavat is a verb which means to advise. On savyetaval minye ichik vrachu. On savyetaval minye ichik vrachu. He advised me to go to a doctor. So, here savyetavat can also be translated as to give an advice. So, here to give an advice. So, advice is the direct object here which is inherent to the meaning of this verb. So, that is why this advice is not written here and it is inherent to the verb. So, there are a couple of other verbs also where we are not supposed to use the direct objects. It is inherent within the meaning of the verb. So, on savyetaval mini ichik vrachu. He advised me to go to a doctor. So, this was the first use of the dative case of nouns. So, what was the use? This is dative case of nouns are used to denote the indirect objects. So, we will now discuss some other uses as well. The dative case of nouns is also used to denote the logical subjects of some verbs. For example, we have done this verb before naravitsa pandravitsa, which is the synonym of the verb lubit. Lubit is to like. So, naravitsa pandravitsa, prikhajitsa and prichis. Prikhajitsa, prichis, it means one has to. So, these are few verbs which take the dative case of nouns as their logical subject. Why we are saying logical subject? Because for example, munye naravitsa etat dom. Munye naravitsa etat dom. So, if you translate this sentence into English, it will be translated as I like this house. As you can see, this ya is in the dative case. So, ya has been changed into munye, which is the dative case form of the personal pronoun ya. But the subject is ya only. So, what happens is when we represent or when we denote the logical subject, which means the ideal subject which is performing the action, it has to be in the form of dative case, like we have done with naravitsa. So, this is from the second verb we have done prikhajitsa and prichis. One has to. So, this student, female student, has to work a lot. So, here again, aethi student ke is in the form of dative case. So, this student has to work a lot. We have also discussed that a subject has to be in the nominative case. So, that is why I am saying the logical subject. So, here it is not the ideal subject which is to be in the nominative case, but it is the logical subject. So, logically these are the subjects, but they are in the form of dative case. 
the next use of dative cases with some adverbs and words like kholadna nushna nilzya moshna kholadna is cold nushna is nushna is necessary nilzya is is not allowed or never moshna is it is allowed so nilzya and moshna we have done before for example tibya kholadna so here tibya kholadna so again the logical subject is ti which is the second person singular number but ti here is in the form of dative case that is why we are again saying this is the logical subject of this sentence da munya kholadna yes i am feeling cold so are you feeling cold yes i am feeling cold so these are the two uses we have discussed so far the first is with the verbs naravitsa and prikhaditsa to denote the logical subject and with the adverbs and nushna nilzya moshna we use the dative case of nouns as the logical subjects now there are certain prepositions after which we are supposed to use the dative case of nouns for example the preposition per which means movement along the surface on the surface ka movement towards something or someone blaga darya blaga darya is thanks to or because of saglasna is according to or in accordance with so these are some of the prepositions after which we use the dative case of nouns so now we have learned the uses of the dative case of nouns so what are the uses the first one is to denote the indirect objects in a sentence the second one to denote the logical subjects of some of the verbs or adverbs and the last one with some of the prepositions we are supposed to use the dative case of nouns so this is all we have for today's lesson so what all we have learned we have learned the conjugation of verbs we have learned the simple future tense and we have learned the uses of the dative case of nouns so now we will meet in the next lesson till then spasiba nasvidaniya